podcast, Preventing Operator Assaults, is a helpful look at the problem of conflict in and on our community transit systems. We hope that by starting a discussion that includes practical tips and ideas, that we can keep transit operators safe in every community, whether they serve in an urban, rural, or tribal transit environment. This project is funded by a grant from the Federal Transit Administration to improve safety for professional bus drivers and public transit riders throughout the nation. Your host is best-selling author and Transit Unplugged podcast host, Paul Comfort. This is Preventing Transit Driver Assaults. Today, we're talking with longtime trainer Reem Lazaro, a good friend of mine who's been in the public transportation industry for a while and is very well respected. And I'll let my co-host, Christian Joyner, give him his proper introduction. I'm happy to introduce Reem Lazaro, who has 13 years of experience in managing safety and training at three large transit agencies. For the past 30 years of his career, Reem's been a partner of Lazaro and Knoll LLC, a contractor for Boyd Caton Group, supporting the Federal Transit Administration's Bus Safety and Security Program and development of the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan Regulation and an independent transit safety and security consultant trainer. Reem has provided training on behalf of the National Transit Institute, the Transportation Safety Institute, and CTAA. He is a safety and security contractor to the New Mexico DOT. Reem's experience includes consulting on transit safety and security, agency safety and operating plans, safety management systems, safety culture, and safety management leadership. And uh, from my perspective, Reem, I remember in my 20s going to classes that you taught uh, in the 1990s through CTAA and other groups, uh, state transit associations, including TAM, I think, here, where I was president of the Transportation Association in Maryland. And I remember always being impressed by the information you give. That's very kind of both of you. I appreciate it. And it was a lot of TAM action, Paul. You're right. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it's great, man. Well, great to hear your voice again. I always tell you, you sound like an, uh, you, you've got one of those late night FM DJ voices, man. So great to have you on the podcast. <laughs> Hopefully I don't live that lifestyle. I yeah, that's, <laughs> well, it, it might be all right. Uh, they just don't pay a whole lot usually. So, um, hey, let's get, let's dive right into the topic. Preventing transit driver assaults, as you know, Reem, is one of the hot topics in our industry right now across transit agencies, large and small. Tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, the risk itself. What are we talking about here? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a good place to start. First, I'd like to suggest that I, although I understand this issue is, is a critically important one, um, in large urban systems and is pervasive, unfortunately, but I just wanted to say it is also a critically important one in small urban and rural systems. Does it happen less often? Yes. Thank God. But is the impact catastrophic? Absolutely. So. Well, you know, we'll, our discussion is is really going to focus on large urban, small urban, and rural systems, and I think it has equal applicability. So, first, let's define what is conflict. Conflict is a disagreement in which the people involved see a threat to their needs, interests, or concerns. A key element then of conflict really is the idea that each person may have a different perception of any given situation. The passenger traits that may lead to conflict include, certainly not limited to, under the influence of alcohol or drugs, mental health issues, under high personal stress, people are dealing with the difficulty of being transient or homeless, resenting authority and regulations, teenagers acting out, angry about transit service, and quite frankly, sometimes just angry in general. And what are some examples of conflict sources? Here's some examples. Pandemic requirements, fare disputes, use of profanity, bringing food or drink on board, delays in service, vandalism of the vehicle, objects being thrown, unwanted advances or harassment, shouting or loud music, bullying, language or cultural differences, and other inappropriate behavior. Back at you, Paul. Yeah, and so... If one of those things happen, kind of the the uh, the new trend, I think, is to uh, tell our drivers, "Hey, you may not need to take this on on yourself. Maybe on the other hand, you might want to de-escalate it." What do you think of that? 
Yeah, I think that's true. And, I, and what you raised, and we'll cover it a little later in our discussion, but there is a fail-safe point where, you know, you decide that de-escalation strategies aren't working. That's when you need to protect yourself and your customers. And that's where, frankly, your common sense and, and experience comes to play. So, I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about, and maybe this isn't the right place for it, but I mean, Reem, really, uh, it can get really bad where there's maybe an active shooter or something like that. So shouldn't that be part of the overall training uh, that we're looking at doing? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. We aren't discussing active shooter training in this podcast, but I, I, if you're asking me personally and, and probably ask anyone in the industry, given the state of the world right now, it is critically important that you provide active shooter training to all employees of an agency uh, and follow DHS guidelines. They're out there and, and cover active shooter on the bus, which is a horribly difficult situation, obviously, and active shooter in a transit facility. That training is critically important. So back on the bus, I'm going to ask you a question. And after your answer, I'm going to ask Kristen to do a follow-up. Uh, why don't you talk us through some of the de-escalation strategies um, for situations that might occur on the bus for a, for a professional bus operator? Yeah. And let me focus first on uh, the uh, conflict, potential conflict or escalating conflict between a passenger and a driver. And, you know, I think first we, we need to look, take a quick look at communication. We communicate three ways, Paul. Words, what we actually say. Tone, how we say those words. And body language, which is a primary means of communication. And these three aspects combine to express an overall message. It's important that you make a good first impression. Because first impressions form within seconds of any interaction. A first impression is an evaluation based on your appearance, your body language, your demeanor, your mannerisms. So greet passengers with a warm, confident smile that hopefully can put them at ease. Make eye contact. And the reason why you're doing that is you're basically saying to the passenger, you are in charge of this environment, the environment on the vehicle. And you're also checking out the passenger at the same time to see if they may present a risk down the road. Then comes into play situational awareness. That, that's really a concept where you try as much as you can, and this isn't easy, to assess a situation in a non-motional way. Uh, be mindful of your own stress responses. You got to know yourself. Don't allow yourself to be provoked. Maintain your self-control. To do that, you've got to know what your hot buttons are, and you've got to develop strategies to overcome your reaction to your hot button, button being pushed. Take a time out, if necessary, to get yourself calmed down. Think through how to handle the situation. Listening is a critical element of this communication you're in. You listen so you can identify the problem. You listen so you can filter out unnecessary information. Um, and it gives you a chance to repeat back what your perception of the problem is to get some validation from the passenger that is causing you problems. Ask open-ended questions. What you're trying to do with that, this is kind of a tricky concept, but understand this. You're trying to get them to think rather than react. And you're trying to get them to talk rather than just re reject and respond. So you use questions like who, what, where, when, and how. Um, you're trying to get them into a rational state. And then, of course, because people are looking for help, you try to offer help or option. And always keep your messages short and clear. More words, more problems for misinterpretation. Yeah, uh Hey, Reem, um, that was great about passenger and driver, especially like the communication using, you know, that you've got to, you've got to know that communication involves words, tone, and body language, and that you must know yourself and what your hot buttons are. But what if you are observing passenger on passenger de-escalation? What do you do about that? Yeah, that's a really good question because it is tricky. Um, there are some general guidelines that I'll throw out there, but 
This is a case where you really have to use your experience, common sense, skills, et cetera, and, and bring those into place as you evaluate what you're dealing with. Generally, you stay aware of your general customer service skills and, and the same de-escalation skills we've already talked about. Make, remember, you're making eye contact with each passenger when they board. Uh, you're greeting the passengers when they board. And you're using that rearview mirror to keep an eye on passengers that may have raised concerns to you when they board. So that's really focuses in using the mirror or even at times when uh, the vehicle is not in motion to literally turn around and look. So what are the strategies? If you've identified a problem between two passengers, Kristen, the first thing is to pull the vehicle to a safe location off the roadway, park open the doors. What you're allowing is the escape opportunity, not only for other passengers and perhaps even yourself, but for the perpetrator as well. So that they at any point can say, whoops, I know this has gone too far. I want out of here. And they can do it and never chase them down the street. Say, thank God they've left the vehicle and let them run, let them go away. So you identify a problem Then what you try to do is separate the people. And and this could be facilitating movement of the problem passenger to another seat or alternately move the passenger that's being harassed to another seat. If the problem passenger doesn't cooperate or the problem behavior doesn't stop, that's when you contact dispatch. And that's when you let them know that you are probably going to need some kind of supervisory or even law enforcement response. So that's passenger on passenger de-escalation. And never, by the way, get yourself physically in the middle of that conflict. That's good, Reem. You know, uh, I've got a relative that is a teacher in a school and they're teaching very similar things to teachers there as well, I can tell you. Hey, this is such good information. I think we, we want to continue on part two of this podcast Reem, we will go into signs of escalation conflicts and tactics to respond to escalation and reacting to potentially dangerous situations. Let me thank you for being our guest on part one of this podcast talking about preventing transit driver assaults. Thanks, Reem. We'll pick back up on part two. All comments, tips, and ideas are the express opinion of the individuals and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Transit Unplugged the Federal Transit Administration, CTAA, SWTA, TTI, or their subsidiaries. Thanks for listening.